episode of the Omid and Kojo show. Today we've got another special episode for you. A couple of weeks ago we had uh, an interview with me, Omid, <laughs> <laughs> and in today's episode we're going to have a little uh, look at the life and times of our old boy Samuel Kojo Plummer. We're going to dig deep, we're going to get into all sorts of shit. He doesn't know what I'm going to ask him yet, yeah. but I'm going to ask him some pretty funny shit. So this should be entertaining. So, stage is yours. Let's get straight into it. Um, let's start with where you're from, where you were born and raised, and the early years of right. Sam Kojo. Sam Kojo, early years. Well, what I remember <laughs> of the early years, what I know about what I was doing. <laughs> so I was born in Birmingham, born and raised Birmingham man. Brummy man. That's why I got this funny voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, lived with my parents. We lived in a really shit place when I was born. Well, it wasn't, it was just a bit rough. Mm. Um, my next door neighbor got kind of killed, <laughs> but not really killed. It was an old woman, and there were like gangs around the area. There was a lot of burglaries, yeah. and someone broke into her house, and she had a heart attack and died. And after that, we thought, well, my parents thought, it's time we leave this area. Yeah. We need to move somewhere nicer, really, as we got all these, these young kids. It's weird. I feel like burglaries don't ha- like house burglaries don't happen as much nowadays. Oh, I think they're happening. We just don't, we're not hearing about it. That's true. That's true. But it was so prevalent when I was younger. Like, I knew loads of people whose house got burgled. My house got burgled. You as well. Like, yeah. I don't know. But yeah. What was that like? I don't know. I was Did like you? Three. Oh, okay. You were that young. <laughs> yeah, we moved when I was four, I think. Okay, okay. I also cracked my head open when I lived at that house. What was that like? I, was in, uh, <laughs> I, I fell over and cracked my head open on some concrete. <laughs> it's bad. I had to go to hospital and whatnot. <laughs> oh, that'd be stressful. Imagine having a it's kid. Stressful for like, mom. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, having blood pissing out of your kid's head. No, oh, one of her kids. She still like to deal with the other ones. Fuck it, huh? Your, your brother and sister I think she was well. pregnant at the time oh my lord my sister you are a hassle no, I, been like, hassle I used to just birth. run off I used to just <laughs> run away I'd always, that's what my mum says that I'd always just run and she, she'd be trying to chase after me while pregnant <laughs> and then I like tripped and smacked smack my head open <laughs> after she's told you countless times <laughs> stop running because you're going to hurt yourself yeah yeah that, that was the early childhood it was um Good, I think. I don't remember much. What were you? What were you like as a young child, though? If I, you I can't ran necessarily remember. A lot. a lot, lot of running. A lot of just, just having a lot of energy. Really, accidentally hurting other kids. My whole life I've been accidentally hurting other kids. I've always just been very strong. And now he channels that into snapping his shoelaces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I snap my shoelaces all the time. Actually, it's happened through, like multiple pairs of shoes, and it just doesn't happen to anyone else. I just think, oh, I just tie it nice and tight. And as I pull it, it just like snaps off. It's happened loads. I've never known it to happen to anyone else. It no. Pisses never. me off. Never once happened to me. Ever. It's one of the things I have to deal with in my life. <laughs> you could just not pull it as tight. I'm just trying to have tight shoes. But I feel like, you, I, I don't know. Let's I not need get tight it. shoes on. Yeah, but you can have the tightest shoes in the world without snapping your shoelaces. I feel like there's just some kind of tech that you're just not getting and you're just pulling it somehow wrong. Maybe, Maybe <laughs> someone made a tutorial on it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, what what kind of upbringing did you have? Was it stern? Was it super strict? Was it, mm. would you say it was a relatively normal upbringing or were there any like, because ins- uh, everybody has like insane rules that only their family kind of, has was there anything yeah. like that that sticks out to you um i think the main thing for me and this is going forward to like primary school like 5 to 11 or whatever i didn't have so many of the games and things that other people had because mm. we had a, a money limit on christmas presents so there couldn't be more than like 50 pounds mm. which I, I i didn't mind not having i wasn't like whinging all the time that i don't have what my friends had i was just like yeah fair I was quite happy with it. Used to play a lot of Lego. 
had an older brother. We, we had the demo for Championship Manager. So you could play like one season of this football manager game. And we just play one season over and over again for years. Instead of like getting the proper game. <laughs> That's funny. I don't know, but that kind of that kind of shapes you though. And you can really see it as you've grown. Like your, your ability to like... Frugal. Yeah, to kind of, <laughs> I don't know, make do and like not want too much because it's a big it's problem with like it's materialism a yeah you'll always just want more and more yeah so i try and just i think it's best to just kind of be happy with what you've got and if you do want more that's fine like work towards that but still just always take time to appreciate what you've got yeah i try and think about it like most days now like mm-hmm. how great it is that i do have a 15 foot trampoline that i can go on in my garden because that's something I did want for years. I, I asked my parents for years and years, and they, they wouldn't let me have a bigger trampoline. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was a dream of mine as like a teenager. Well, you were telling me a story about when you were in, uh, I think it was RE or something. Oh, the RE one. Yeah. Yeah, I found this quite interesting. So I found um, an old RE book. So religious education. Uh, when I was in year seven, which is first year, like secondary school, so I was like 11 or 12 or something, then um, they asked us to draw, to draw our idea of heaven because it's just interesting, isn't it? Get yeah. the kids all working about heaven, learning about what people think of heaven. And what I drew was just a, a wall and a crash mat because since I was like 11, 12, or even earlier, then my dream was just to have a crash mat so that I could learn flips. So all I really wanted, my, yeah, my idea of the perfect heaven would be having a wall with a crash mat underneath that I could learn flips off. And at that age, yeah, that's all I, I wanted. But it just seemed so unattainable. Mm. Didn't actually achieve that dream until like five, six years later, the wall and crash mat dream. Well, you had a wall But I achieved it. No, well, I mean, I had access to one when oh, I started okay, going to okay. gym and I was going to say... How has that never come up that you yeah, had a crash? I imagine. Mate? But yeah, um, I, I've, I think that's really interesting because like, even at such a young age, like that was your one and only, like that was your dream. It was never nurtured though. It's one of those where this is, this is actually the main reason I coach and the main thing I base my coaching around, mm-hmm. especially coaching in person with, um, with kids, with kids especially. Mm-hmm. With kids, then m- the majority of it isn't about the technique. I don't even spend much time explaining technique to them. I've taught kids wall flips and stuff without really like telling them how to do a wall flip because to be honest, especially with children and they're young and mobile, most of it is just down to like what they believe they're capable of and their confidence in themselves. Mm -hmm. So most of what I do is just try to build confidence and try to get kids to understand that if they want to, they can get really good. And if they want to learn this, then they can learn this. Because I know that if someone had told me when I was a kid with a trampoline, I could just do front flips and back flips. And I went to these trampoline classes when I was young from about 12. And um, the coaches were really shit. Like they well, they're pretty restricted, aren't they? Yeah. So all they would ever have me do is front flip and back flip. But if I had someone like me, like saying, "Oh, try this, try that. You could do that. You know, if you train really hard, you could get really good." Then I probably would have started training then and got good. And I mean, that's just my life. I can't go back and change it. Yeah. But I'd like more kids to know what they're capable of because no one really tells you it's weird my whole life no one ever told me that i could get really good at something Mm. like i'd look at olympic level trampolinists and people like that when i was young and i was so impressed and i thought it was incredible i'd look at b-boys i used to think that was incredible Mm. and eventually free running but i didn't really know how to as a kid how to do that myself i didn't have this skill that I have now to like analytically break stuff down and figure out how to do it because I just thought it wasn't possible I thought there was no way I could learn that so why even try yeah. and all it would really take is someone to tell me so that's why yeah, that's the main reason I coach just to give little inspirational speeches to kids and to just tell them that not even just with tricking but if they want to get incredibly good at something if they want to be one of the best in the world at something then they can do it 
that would be really hard but I kind of tell them the process of getting really good at anything because yeah I can't believe my whole childhood the whole schooling system and everything I, no no one once ever told me how to get good at things and yeah. I get that most people have never gotten good at anything good to the extent I'm talking about good to being one of the best at it I mean I know I'm not incredible at tricking but I've done like over 20 gainer switches which only a few people in the world have done mm-hmm. so I've gotten fairly far in, in one area at least yeah. and um, I feel like most people never get that far in anything mm-hmm. and I think if you don't get that far in anything then how are you going to tell kids that they can do that because yeah. you don't really know you don't even believe that they could do that yeah. it's just something every ra- every so often some kid will be so talented in their mind and they'll be able to get really good at something but I believe that any kid pretty much any kid can get really good at something Pretty much any able-bodied kid could get really good at tricking. Maybe not Jose. Maybe not. They'll be. They might not be a prodigy. They might not be the best. But any kid can get very good. Yeah, I agree. And that's. It, it's funny you should bring up the education system and stuff because it, it's kind of. I feel like it's a pretty big generational thing because not only with the education system. Like I know that both of our parents. Like there's probably quite a cap on what they would have been willing to say we're capable of because it's not safe. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And there's a big there's a big fear because not only do they want do they not have the experience of getting really really good at something. Like I'm sure they they're good at some things but like not world class level at anything really. And it's harder for them to see that as ca- as possible for their child and also they don't want their kid to be disappointed. They also don't want to fill their head with this kind of I don't know foolish sense that they can do whatever they want because I think there's a big difference because a lot of people they'll either say you can do whatever you want but then not give you anything else after that and it's just kind of filling your head with fluff yeah whereas I know what you mean they say you can achieve anything you set your mind to but not like actually breaking it down like what's because I've heard that as a kid but what is setting your mind to something? I didn't really understand that. Mm-hmm. What, what is setting your mind to it? If they told me you can achieve anything you want, if you're prepared to put in hours every single day and do it when you don't even want to do it mm-hmm. and really focus on it and constantly be working towards it, then that would make sense. But they just say, you set your mind anything. to it. I'm yeah. like, well, what, what does that mean? Yeah. And no, I think that's, that's a big problem because there is never any third option, it's especially in the education system. But that's... I understand why these things are in place because of fear and because of, you know, it just makes everything more difficult if you've got everyone trying to be the best. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But would would that be something, would that be a piece of advice that you would give yourself if you were to go back? Because I know you asked me the same question. If I were to go back, then, yeah, I'd just tell myself what I was capable of. That's the main thing. Because I just had no clue that I'd be capable of learning of doing whatever really because I know that if I put enough time and effort into most things I could do them well, I know that now but I, I wish I'd known that at an earlier age how far back though how old would you be because the thing is there comes a point where you I it doesn't matter I my childhood as well that's the thing because it was nice not having a care in the world and just playing RuneScape all the time I got pretty good at RuneScape so. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get into that but why I mean what what age do you reckon the reason the reason I ask is because I know that people have said things to me throughout my entire life but sometimes it will take two three four years for it to actually hit me yeah and what do you think you knowing you when you were that age would have listened um I think I would have listened to the right person if there was someone who could do if there was someone who could do a backflip on the floor and they were telling me this I would have listened to them okay okay yeah, that's interesting. So any age, just as long as you saw when them as like credible 11, enough. If I saw them, because I just thought flips were the coolest thing in the whole world. Yeah. If I saw some, if I saw them do a flip, I'd think they were the just the coolest human alive. <laughs> so I'd be like, yeah, just tell me what to do. I'll do it. So what were you like in in school? Um, not good. <laughs> no, I was all right. I was all right at my work, kind of average. I wasn't in the the dumb kids groups. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of in the top top sort of groups, but like one of the worst in worst performing in the high groups. Yeah, that's kind of my education. Uh, yeah. Um, 
I just spent a lot of time I, just laughing. I just remember my throat and my face. I'd have these like really achy cheeks all the time because I'd spend so much time in my childhood laughing. <laughs> like it would hurt my face. Because just with my friends, we were just always laughing about everything. So I was always messing around at school, doing things that I found funny with my friends. Just pissing around, getting in a lot of trouble. Not like bad stuff. I never did much malicious stuff. Mm. Just stupid just things, things. That you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, just things like putting a tomato on top of the cupboards in the food room and leaving it for weeks, and the room was <laughs> st- smelling really bad, and no one knew why. And I'd <laughs> giggle about it every every class. That that sort of thing. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> what yeah. were your What were your favorite uh, subjects in school? Mm, P, because I got to run around a bit. <laughs> um, it depended on the teacher, really, and yeah, that the, was a the, big one none of the me. subjects really interested me. I don't remember being interested in any of my classes, really. It was just depended who was in my class yeah. and who I sat by. Mm. That that depended how much I enjoyed that class, really, and who the teacher was. Were you into like dance or drama or anything like that? Um, both of those. Yeah, both me of too. Those. Yeah, I was um, I played a lead in a play once mm-hmm. when I was twelve, <laughs> and I, I did this whole monologue scene, and I just remember I had to be in a sack. Yeah, so I was, I was on say. stage in a sack by myself doing this whole monologue, <laughs> and I had to really project my voice. So I remember being in that sack and like going for it, and I had to shout like "Throw me in the river" because <laughs> I need I needed to I, my character needed to be thrown in the river in a sack for some reason. <laughs> And yeah, that, that went really good. <laughs> and then there's my dancing history. Well, I used to be able to dance when I was a kid, but now I can't do it at all. I've like forgotten how to dance. I used to have rhythm, but then I just like lost it because I didn't dance for like five, six years and it's just gone completely. But when I was a kid in year eight, we went to France. That was my only childhood trip abroad because mm. my parents always took us to Cornwall, like south of England. We never, we never went on any trips abroad. I didn't go on a plane until I was 18. But yeah, we went to France for this activity camp thing with school. We had a dance competition. I won the whole thing. <laughs> it was hype. I was just in it, battling people. And I just, I don't think I'd even done it before, but I just did the worm in the battle and everyone lost their shit and it was hype. I, I, I chucked like a round off because I could do round offs. I think I could do a one hand round off. Yeah, I was doing um, so shit. Yeah, and I won the whole thing. And then I was in a, <laughs> a little breakdance performance for the school where I did my cartwheel to one hand round off. Everyone lost their shit yes, again. Yeah. Too. Um, I'd, do, I'd lose my shit now. So I just needed someone to teach me flips, really. You could tell that I always wanted to do it. But yeah, I used to do dance sort of things, but never like taught by anyone. I've mm. never been taught properly how to do movement stuff. Which is one of, one of the reasons why I coach, because I, I think if I was taught from the age of like 12, then I think I could have been I don't know, like a child prodigy type. I think I would have gotten really, really good just because I always had the passion for it. I always had a lot of passion for it. I'd go out on my garden trampoline and I'd just do flips until I was pouring with sweat and couldn't breathe. I'd just keep doing flips until I was lying on the trampoline, like get, trying to get my breath back. And then I'd get up after like a couple minutes and then I'll just do a load more flips. And if I had guidance and I was working towards goals and I knew technique and just, if I had some kind of support, then I feel like I could have been incredibly good at tricks. Now I'm grateful that I managed to get pretty good at tricks, but with some support, I just know I would have, I had so much potential like everyone does, but I definitely had the passion to get incredibly good. And that's one of my, It doesn't make me sad, but I do kind of wish that I could have been that person who had a coach who really helped them and told them what they could achieve and like told them how to push themselves. Not necessarily even in tricking. It would have been the same in tumbling, trampolining, any flip related thing or free running. If I was guided by the right person, I think I would have been really good at it. So that... It does a yeah. It upsets me a little bit. I, that that's the one thing I wish was different in my life that I'd had that from a younger age and just had support. I've always wanted support in my flips because I've never had any really, oh. and that's why I try and support as many people online as I can 
some of the people that message me, some of the kids especially, sometimes I won't even give them technique advice because it's not what's most important at the time. I'll just tell them that they can get really good and that they need to do these moves hundreds of times and then they'll get incredibly good and that they've got to be confident in themselves and that a huge portion of them getting good is down to how much they can believe in themselves. So I tell a lot of people that because I know that would make a huge difference to me. And I know it makes a huge difference to them because people have told me like months down the line how it's really helped them. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. It's, it's interesting that like it's affected you so much to the point where it's like, you know what? You want to really change other people's lives in the ways that you wish you had when you were younger. All right, so moving on to your adolescent years. <laughs> what were you like going through secondary school when you were first coming up what kind of person were you what were you up to what were your thoughts like i wasn't particularly loud i'd be i'd be funny sometimes sometimes i'd say really funny shit in the class and everyone would lose their shit and it'd be hilarious um i'd get into a lot of arguments with teachers mm. not in like me going mental screaming way i wasn't like one of those freaky super angry kids mm. like I was somewhat angry under the surface like most teenage boys yeah. but not like over the top I wasn't like aggressive and violent, <laughs> trying to fight teachers or anything like that I just kind of argue with them in a trolling way as mm. well like when they'd be shouting at me then I'd kind of be be trolling them yeah. like one time in my head of year then <laughs> I forgot what I did to really piss her off because we'd always have a back and forth like I'd I'd always wind her up and she, she'd get pissed at me. She, did, she didn't like me. I remember at the end of school when we left, someone asked her which, who like pissed her off the most and she fed me. And I was like pumped about it. But uh, yeah, one time in detention, I was just looking at her like this. And she was like, why? <laughs> what are you doing? And she was just like, will you stop smiling at me like that? And I, and I just pointed to the wall and I was like, and it just had this banner on the wall that said a smiling face makes this a happy place and I was just like eh, eh. <laughs> so I was kind of always trolling teachers like that which they didn't really like yeah. so yeah I eventually kind of got kicked out but not completely I got somewhat kicked out of school for various reasons it all just I, built up right yeah but I didn't but they were too harsh kicking me out because the head of year really didn't like me so I forgot what it even was that I did the specific thing but yeah I got kicked out it was a little unfair but it was kind of early study leave because it was only three months till I finished school anyway so for the last few months and I just kind of homeschooled myself and my mom helped me and I'd tramp well I wasn't like training tr tricks but that's when I first started doing trampoline like every day because I was at home every day yeah. so my revision breaks would be me bouncing on the trampoline and by the time I'd done my GCSEs that's when I that's when I learned backflip on the floor. So me getting kicked out of school, it helped quite well. I like really, that's when I really got into tramp and flips. Mm. Um, but yeah, I did decently in my GCSEs, got all A's and B's, mm. much to my head of yours. <laughs> Disappointment. <laughs> Disappointment, yeah, she didn't, she wasn't too happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I still got to go to prom and stuff because they were too harsh on me and they knew it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's cool. But what what were you up to in your spare time besides tramp? What were you doing? Runescaping. Yeah. I'd runescape. I started playing runescape when I was eleven. Played till I was like fifteen. So I did. I put in a lot of hours on runescape. Had quite a few ninety nines. <coughs> decent amount of GP. That was all right. That was all right. Yeah, I was just always listening to Green Day, Red Hot Chili Peppers, <laughs> Lincoln Park, Avenged Sevenfold. Uh, yeah, just playing RuneScape, Slipknot, Corn, all of that, knocking out RuneScape hours. I really enjoyed it. I had quite a solid work ethic towards it as well. Like I'd, I'd set my alarm for 5 a.m. I'd get up before school to get some extra like wood cutting in, make a bit of cash. I was always a little bit of a businessman. Like I'd sell RuneScape money for real money. I'd sell accounts for real money. I'd get family friends. So family friends, like kids, like 10 year olds, I was like 13, 14 at the time. I'd get them to train up accounts and I'd give them in-game money for their like main account 
for them doing that work for me. And then I'd sell the account that they trained up for real money. <laughs> so I had this whole RuneScape business thing going on that I used to make a little bit of money. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd get a load of people into RuneScape. I'd get them started on RuneScape and then they'd get hooked and they want money and then I'd sell them GP. So, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. What were, uh, what were some of the things that you were most proud of from any age? So like from, you, from the earlier years and then from the older years, because I'm assuming that a lot of it would have been RuneScape based things at one point. <laughs> but what about when you were a lot younger? Because I know there were various things in my life where I was just super pumped and it would keep me beaming for weeks. What kind of what kind of things were you getting pumped about? Mm. I don't know. I was pretty. I was pretty into my press ups. <laughs> I was pretty into my press ups. I used to just do press ups like all the time because I had so much energy. Mm. When you're a kid, you just your body feels great all the mm. time. I was just doing tons of press ups every day. There was a point where I could just knock out a hundred in one go, like not even rushed or anything. I was like, I could easily do a hundred press ups. I just do press ups all the time. So I got pretty good at them. And I was, so that's why when I started doing flips, I was already really strong. Like I had a lot of explosive power. Like the first time I did a backflip, then I never bailed, I never fell on a backflip ever again after that. I could just do, I never ever fell on it. I could do it every time. And I learned, I could do standing layout the same week I learned standing back tuck because I just had enough power. It was only the fear that was really holding me back with stuff. Yeah, when I started, it was always just fear that stopped me from doing things, not power. Like when I did go for stuff, I'd normally be able to just do it. Mm. But I wasn't flexible because I'm kind of flexible now. My tricks look fairly flexible, I think. But yeah, when I started, I was someone who could not touch their toes, like not even close. I was the stiffest man. <laughs> I've just stretched for a very long time to get to this point. Yeah. So yeah, I was proud of my press-ups. I used to always go on about them. <laughs> <laughs> telling people that just do not care. Yeah. I was always doing that kind of shit when I was young. Just telling people about things that I loved and they just didn't They're give like, a what? fuck. What? what? Fuck off on me. <laughs> Um, who were who were some people, whether you knew them or not, that inspired you or that you looked up to that you just thought were like the coolest people? At what point? Just any point, because like it's been different over different yeah, just ages. throughout throughout your childhood up to like sixteen or something. Well, when I was younger, when I was like twelve, thirteen, fourteen, or yeah. then always like rock stars, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, yeah, Lincoln Park, like Chester. Yeah. Or I was into them and Avenged Sevenfold. I, I don't know, I was just into like bands and oh. yeah, I just thought they were cool. Uh -huh. Trying to think who else I really was impressed by and looked up to. It was mainly just that, yeah, it was mainly mu music people. Mm. And I always was incredibly impressed by athletes as well. Yeah, yeah. like uh, the Olympics, I loved. I, I yeah, yeah. loved watching the Olympics. The gymnastics and trampoline was always what I was drawn to and found most interesting because mm -hmm. I thought it was incredible. That's cool. Did you uh, did you ever get into any kind of music? No. Nah. Oh, actually, actually, actually. Um, we did make a rap at, some, at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did make a rap. Uh, it was like for my form. So, so like my, my class that I went through school with. We had like a class rap about our teacher and whatnot, Mr. Nazran. Oh, no. <laughs> Snazzy Nazzy. Do you remember any of it? Um, no, I, could, I can recall it sometimes. Sometimes it, like yeah. recently it's come into my head and I've known the words. <laughs> but I can't think of it right now. But yeah, we had a little rap. And then um, when I actually started doing flips, then I was very heavily inspired by people. Yeah, my getting into flips was based on me listening to a lot of people who inspired me really hard. So I'd just listen to a lot of inspirational speeches. I listened to Arnold Schwarzenegger and whatnot. Back in the dictaphone days. Yeah, the one from Rocky. I'd have um, all these inspirational speeches. Who was that black guy? On my dictaphone. Oh yeah, the hip hop preacher guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric, whatever his name. Yeah, I'd just be into like motivational speaker people. And then, but I just listen to them. That's the thing that I don't get. So many millions of people listen to these motivational speeches, but then don't act on it. 
But when I was like 16, I just believed it. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger talking about how to just become great and do all these things. I was like, cool. And then I just trained like three times a day and just, I just did what he said. And it worked pretty good. I progressed a lot. Yeah, I just took on board what was said that you have to work really, really hard, train when you don't even want to train, all that. Mm. And that, that's what I did. Mm. Yes. I get why people don't do it though. Because they see something as un- unobtainable. What, something, it just made sense to me. Like Yeah, but something that, you, I don't know, you and I share that we've never really, I don't know, it's just never been something that's concerned me. Like, for, remember that gym session when we were at Nuneaton and there was that guy that was saying that we were, we, we were intimidating the other people on the floor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that kind of shit's never really, I don't know, it's never really affected me. Like, if I've seen somebody that's really, really good at something... I don't look at them and be like, oh, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't scare me. It doesn't make me think I can't do that because they can do it. It makes me think, I wonder how I can do that. But do you think that was something that, because you said that you never had anybody saying you can do this or you should push yourself in this. And if you work hard enough at anything, then you can do this. What is, what is it that, I don't know, that made you th- listen to those inspirational p- speeches and just... I think, you know what, maybe I can do it. I just got older and smarter. When I, because I was like 15, it was like two weeks before I turned 16 when I landed backflip. Okay. I, when I learned backflip in my garden. And after that, I was like, oh, so if I can do this, like once you get past backflip, then you can really learn a load of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really started getting into it. Within a month or so, then I was, I had my mind set, like I, was, I wanted to become one of the best free runners in the world. Like that was the plan. Like I was like, and I didn't expect it to happen overnight. I was like, I'll work on it for 10 years. That's what I was pl- going into it, planning to do. I was like, I love doing this so much. All I want to do is flips. I'll just do this all the time and get good at this. Mm. I just, it, it fascinates me the way that some people can interpret the exact same information and not, it'd just be a completely different thing. You know what I'm saying? Like with those inspirational speeches, like, There'll be people, like Gary Vee, for example. Mm. There's so much gold in the things that he says, but then the people that are watching that and then never do anything with their lives, I'm like, how are you watching this? Because I watched him for a little while. When I first discovered him, I was watching him for like two or three weeks, and I was like, I need to start watching this man and do implement stuff. the things that he's telling me to do, and then I did. And then that kind of push me into I don't know it's just it's just strange but I always wondered like is it an intrinsic thing that makes you do that or do you think it was like your surroundings or do you think it was a combination of both um, I think also my upbringing as well I think because my dad's always worked really hard I think having someone who's a role model who actually works hard to do what they like want to do, do to achieve yeah. what they want to achieve just sets a really good example. I think if I didn't have a, a mom or dad who was like really hard working and motivating, then it would have been a lot harder for me. Mm. Yeah, with, without that example from someone. Yeah, then I, I would have had a tougher time. Yeah. But um, also just me as well, because there's, I mean, there's differences with every person, isn't there? I feel like my mind, well, I always used to think that I thought in a way different way to everyone else. And then I was like, nah, that's just me being a stupid teenager. Everyone thinks that. But as I've gotten older, then I realize it is somewhat true. I do think different to most people in that there's a lot of things I don't understand why people do them. I don't, I don't get at all. Like, I mean, I've always been, since I was like 14, 14, 15, then I've been working towards breaking out of caring what people think about me. I always thought it was the stupidest thing ever when my friends would like, we, we'd be chilling and then we were gonna go to the shop and they'd put on jeans to go to the shop. And I was like, no, no one cares. <laughs> Who's looking at your legs? No one cares what you look like. Like I wouldn't look in the mirror. I'd, I'd be like, why, why, just, why would that matter at all? I never understood it. I How about like, now? What's the point? Not really. Like now, I'd get it. I'd put on jeans and make an effort if I'm going somewhere where there would where where there's single girls and I'm single yeah, yeah. and I'm trying to trying to get in there. But now I'm in a relationship as well. 
what what's the point why would i what is the point why would i ever try and make myself look good like who cares i don't fucking care i i that's what i don't understand like if you've already got a girlfriend i i mean look good for them like when i'm going out with with her i try and like make a bit of an effort for her sake but if she's not there i'm not trying to get with some other girl or something i'm not trying to look good for some men what is the point i mean just i don't as, understand it just as a side note i think honestly it's, for a lot of people it is for other people but for some people it could just be because they feel better when they think they look better which is something that i think you kind of don't yeah but i think that's a bad thing i don't think you should root like how you feel about yourself and how you look because how you look is always going to deteriorate and then do you want how you think about yourself to deteriorate no but at the same i don't know we could get into this because i mean if i cared more about how i looked then it would be upsetting me a lot more like losing my hair and stuff and that's mm-hmm. in a couple of years that's going to look terrible mm-hmm. but luckily it's not going to be too bad for me but for some people that would be terrible if yeah. they really people who really care about how they look and put a lot of effort into it mm. no and, that's fair i understand yeah. that i do get it but i feel like the, there's the other side of it where it's like it's not going to last forever so why not enjoy it while you can which is something that I kind of feel because like with fashion and stuff like that like it's not so much about I don't know it's more we're, we're getting off topic it doesn't matter well you know what <laughs> I've always been somewhat anti-consumerism mm-hmm. anyway mm-hmm. like less so now though I still don't consume for the sake of consuming but I've got a more positive view on it mm-hmm. I see it as like yeah it is a good thing like capitalism's done a lot of great things for the world yeah but i don't want to be the one who's wasting money on shit i'm i'm fine before i was like why are people wasting their money on bullshit now i'm like yeah fair enough do what you want i don't care if you want to do that but i'm not gonna really take part i'd rather be on the selling side yeah no, than buying you. bullshit but yeah 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 it ain't that deep. Though, that's because I've always gotten my happiness from the flutes. Yeah. Really. So nothing else really comes close. So I don't invest much effort and energy into it. Mm. I don't know. It's a gift and a curse though. Because investing so much into the one thing, when you do lose yeah, it, yeah. it hurts so much. That fall is so much harder than anything else. Yeah, it is really tough. It- we we're not going to get sad though no we're not going to get sad we're not going to get sad but we can have an honest conversation well I did want to talk about something that's not it's not super sad but I'd say injuries really really shaped my life and my personality and who I am because um, the big injury in 2013 when I was out for a year I feel like that changed that's transitioned me from a child to an adult Mm -hmm. like uh, when I got injured I was still a child and then I was never the same after that because when like facing real because there was other shit going on as well at the same time yeah. and just facing some real shit did kind of turn me into an adult in some ways bit more cynical less energetic but wiser from it like it's a balance it's a trade off isn't it yeah so it is that's weird. a real turning point in my life it's weird how I don't know bad things usually come in threes don't they and I know, I know you and I shared similar experiences with injuries and stuff. And like, it, I think the most important thing is just to not let it get you twisted up. You know what I mean? And become bitter in any way. But it's really, really hard to do that because if you feel like, regardless of whether it's your fault or not, it's not about a blame game. It's about the actuality yeah. that you, you can't do the thing you love exactly. you can't do the one thing you want to do exactly where you get your kind of self-worth from and release yeah but that's why that's why for me it's a bit of a dangerous game I've always had this kind of love-hate relationship mm. with it because I love it so much and I think it's okay that's one thing I've always been all for like when I started I don't care because I don't care that much about being cool and I've always well I've tried to get away from that that's been like i've actually had to work on myself to do that because everyone wants approval from others Mm -hmm. it's just natural but i've tried to like condition myself to not care so much that's one of the reasons why in the old clips i wore those shit clothes i did know that they were shit lots of the time it was kind of proving to myself that i'm gonna look shit 
and I do not care. I'm focused on my tricking. I'm going to the gym to trick. I don't care how I look. That's part of it. I felt like when I was at the gym in shit clothes, then I'd feel less anxious about other people watching me like fail. I wouldn't feel so, I wouldn't feel embarrassed about failing because I was like, I don't care. I already, I'm shit, I don't give a shit. That is just all part of me trying to not give a shit. It's taken a long time, but now, now I don't have to go out of my way to try and prove to myself and prove to other people that I don't give a shit. Because if you're trying to prove to other people you don't give a shit, you still give a shit. Yeah. But now it's like I genuinely don't give much. Still a little bit, which is always going to be there, I think. But don't give much of a shit. I think you should always have a little bit. You should have a little bit. Because otherwise you're just going to be one of those people at Tesco at like two in the afternoon in your pyjamas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. The final question. The question on everybody's lips. What are the weirdest stories that you have from when you were younger? Before you were 16, any age. Just oh, a couple of little instances. Like before I got groomed. <laughs> remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Just the weirdest things you've got up to. Either when you're on your own or with one of your friends or something. I'm trying to think of things that I did on my own because that's the weirdest. Yeah. The weirdest things. There was the one that I didn't talk about and I just forgot about for most of my life until earlier this year. I was like, oh yeah, I used to do that all the time. The, the, the mattress boxing. So what I used to do is I'd put a mattress against my wall and then I'd kind of tilt it, lean it forwards. So it was always trying, it was always like falling down. And then I'd like box the mattress to keep it up. And I'd like work up a proper sweat and I'd just be like boxing this mattress. Um, yeah, and I'd look at videos on YouTube for technique and work on my boxing technique and I'd do that. Why? I, I don't know, I just, I just wanted to. Yeah, but what was going through your head when you were doing it? I work on some boxing skills like in case I want to fight someone I don't know well yeah there it is that's what I wanted to know like is it for just because you like, like doing boxing's it. cool well it was just or? fun as well I just got really into it yeah yeah, yeah. I, got really, I just worked up a sweat and I had a good time I also used to put um, a load of books like big heavy books in plastic bags and use them as dumbbells <laughs> I think this. <laughs> oh no, my, my sister took my old room. But they were in my wardrobe for the longest time, these uh, bags just full of books <laughs> <laughs> that I used to use as weights. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I've always um, been into my exercise. And weird things I used to do. A lot of. It gets weirder around the college age. At school, I wasn't doing that much because I was just doing. playing RuneScape and going home, going to school. Like, I wasn't doing that much weird I used to explore sometimes that was a bit weird I've always done this I still do it to this day and it fucks me up sometimes like sometimes I'm just walking home from somewhere and I just think what if I go this way and I just take some different route and just try and find my way home sometimes I've found shortcuts sometimes I've been lost for like hours because I didn't have a phone as a kid I'd just get lost and it took me like two hours to get home one time but yeah, I, do, I, I still do it. I just go different routes sometimes because I like exploring and figuring out my surroundings, knowing the area. And then, um, yeah, most of the weird stuff started with the flips. I did weirder things with flips when I was going out by myself to different places to do my flips. Unpack that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I had done a lot of angsty flips in my time. What were in you my teenage years. I'd just been to the park in like near pitch black darkness doing flips. There was a period when I used to do that. Like I could barely see. I don't know why. I, I just liked it. I liked the cover of darkness because I didn't like being seen doing my flips. Because people, I don't like people talking to me. It was very antisocial. Nah, I'm very introverted. I've always been very, I've not always been very introverted. I started being very introverted and stopped talking to people when I went to college really when I was like 16, 17 yeah. I slowly like removed myself from society and started just doing flips and that's when I got into like not speaking for days sometimes and then when I went to university like months I just wouldn't speak really yeah no, there was just a there was one point I think the longest I ever went there was two weeks two weeks when I didn't say a word I don't think it was a weird a weird time I was just like training I'd go to my uni lectures go home and I'd like sleep and 
do hook kicks in my little tiny shit uni room. Um, yeah, used to self check out. So I'd have headphones in like the whole time, all the time. I'd just be listening to Radiohead all the time. Um, but that was quite a strange. That was experience. a really sad. Po- that's when I was really, really, really sad. Yeah, that's one of the, the sad points. I didn't used to get sad much as a kid. I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't a sad kid. Yeah. Uh, the sadness only happened. After I started the <laughs> but it's all part of it, isn't it? Yeah, the good and the bad. It, it made it really hard to fit in a uni because obviously no one else is into the same things. Everyone else is into going to the club and drinking and stuff, which I did to try and take part, but I just didn't enjoy it to the same extent. All all I wanted to do was practice my flips. Mm. All I cared about was practicing my flips. I didn't care about the shit that everyone else cared about. So I kind of got more and more isolated from society really. And I had to really <coughs> embrace tricking as my life. Otherwise I feel like I'd be a very lonely person because I have a hard time getting on with people who don't trick. I do know some people who don't trick or get on with fine, but because it's such a huge part of my life and what I do and what I'm interested in, what I like to talk about, it's very hard for me to maintain a friendship with someone who doesn't trick now. Which it is what it is. At least I got housemates, and mates that trick, and my girlfriend tricks, and yeah, it's it's fine. It's just the way it is. It's not a choice. I don't try and isolate myself from people just because I feel so different from them. Over time, that sort of happened. Ugh. Yeah. Strange. Yeah. These relationships, eh? <laughs> well. Yeah. It was lovely getting to know you a little bit further. Well, I hope you've got something from this. Well, yeah. Got to know hope, your old pal Sam Kojo. I hope you guys enjoyed it because this was a pretty a candid look into. I didn't talk about my rage. Sam Kojo, you what? I didn't talk about my rage. Oh, we didn't talk about a lot of shit. Yeah, short story. My, lots of my tricks are based in rage. <laughs> I channel. I used to be much angrier before I started tricking, and I channel all my anger into tricks. That's why my tricks are so... That's why I look furious sometimes when I'm tricking. Yeah. Because I am furious. But not in a... I'm not actually pissed, but I just channel all of the things that I would be pissed about into tricks. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not pissed anymore. But yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Um, if you've got any questions for Kojo, if you... Uh I don't know, if you want to know more about the rage, let us know in the comments. Let me know, we'll have a chat. I'll let you know about it. I'll let you know about the bodies in the closet. (laughs) (laughs) Nah, I'm just kidding. There's no bodies in there. There's all all sorts of manner, all manner of insanity in that closet, but it's best we we don't open that can of worms. Let's not go into that. But, much love. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next episode. Ta-da, Take care. Bye.